Hello, everyone. Uh, happy to be here again today. Uh, might not be here next week. I think I might be taking is it next week. I might be taking a Sunday off. But today I'm here and I'll let you know later uh, if I'm going to do that or not. But today we're going to talk about summer wells. And mm, that's a very sad case. And it's a very recent case. And someone asked me if I would talk about something that was as recent as this. And it all depends. Um, but I got a lot of requests and I took a look at the case and I think there are some interesting things to say about it. And before I start, let me do the business again. Please remember to subscribe so you can support the channel, like the video and also hit the bell so you're get informed about the upcoming shows. And also, hey, if you've got a Facebook page or a Twitter page and or you're on a um, if you're on a in a group that particularly likes to look at different crimes and learns wants to learn about profiling, please do share because that helps support the uh, the the, uh, the channel. Um, now, I want to say something about what's happening with the Summer Wells case, um, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it. Is that this this has gone into one of those crazy speculation things which is very concerning. Um, my channel is not here to speculate about everything in the book, which is why I usually only do one show on a case to bring out, to educate, to help people understand crime scene analysis, help people understand the different issues the police are dealing with, um, how investigations work, uh, what is looked at. Um, sometimes, you know, when people say, well, what, why would you look at the parents in a certain case, like the Summer Wells case? Uh, why wouldn't you just go with abduction? Well, the police have to look at all the possibilities depending on what the evidence is. So that's the kind of things I will point out what the police will be looking at and why they might be looking at these things. Um, to start off with, I want to talk about someone just asked, who, who is it just asked that really good question? Oh, well, it wasn't a question. It was just a wonderful comment. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, just a, a comment that she, she hoped that um, they would find Summer. Um, and that's, I, I can't remember whoever was there. Thank you for saying that because it just brought that up in my mind. Uh, sometimes when I, as a profiler, do cases, um, I don't think so much the way other people think because I'm focused on the crime scene analysis and I forget what people, you know, in the community are thinking and they're thinking, poor little girl. I mean, you know, and they get involved with the case by seeing it on the news and their heart goes out and they want the poor child found. Um, and they, they, they just hope and hope and hope the child will be found alive. Um, and here is a reality check on that. Sadly, there's a, people have, as I said, just said, people have a lot of crazy ideas of what could have happened with her really strange ones. Um, and people believe some of those strange ones because that means the child will be alive. Uh, for example, somebody wanted a little girl her age and so they stole her. <clears throat> And you're going to find her alive, you know, five years later or five months later, because the person who took her wants to love her and wants to take good care of her. Now, does that ever happen? And the answer is yes, but usually with babies, because you can start with a baby and people don't question so much when you arrive home with a baby, especially if, you, if you've been faking a pregnancy for a long time, you're really like heavy and you can say, oh, you know, I was pregnant. you can get away with that. Uh, and the child is not going to remember their birth parents, you know, because they've never really seen them for more than a few days. So that child grows up believing you are the birth parent and, you know, no, is no wiser until maybe some, something, you know, crops up at some point, which lets the cat out of the bag. And then the child is found out to be not the child of the person raising her and that the child indeed was stolen when it was a baby. Um, so that does happen. But usually you don't see people stealing older children, you know, four years old, five years old, because first of all, the kid cries a lot for their parents. They say, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. They remember their parents. So you've got to deal with that. And then what do you do? You can't take them out in the neighborhood, you know, start walking around and they're going, that's not my mommy. You know, <laughs> she stole me. <laughs> that's not terribly wise. So you'd have to take that child and hide her someplace real you know far far away where nobody would see her and eventually she'd forget that she was stolen when she was older that's a lot of work it isn't really useful um so then there's the theory that a pedophile stole her 
and has now got her in the basement. That does happen on occasions. Usually it happens with older girls and boys, uh, teenagers, um, at least 12 or something, because you can shut them up from crying more easily. You know, you can reason with them. Um, you can, you know, manipulate them more easily, but little small children cry a whole heck of a lot and they're miserable. And I always, I always use this as an example. You know, most of us don't even want to watch our friends' kids, you know, for the evening. It's like, oh God, you know, you're going to bring your five-year-old over. Oh God. You know, unless you have another five-year-old to play with that child, you're like, oh, that's going to be a lot of work, you know? And oh, for the whole weekend? Oh God, no, not for the whole weekend. You know, so if we feel that way about children we know, how do you think some creepy dude is going to feel about having to feed this child, you know, take care of it, wash its clothes, bathe it, you know, keep it from screaming and whining, all the things that little children do. And, you know, so most of the time they do not want to do this. So what happens sadly is that when pedophiles grab a child this age, usually the child is dead within the hour. And um, they're usually raped and they're murdered and their bodies are dumped like really quickly. Uh, that's the standard. So if you don't find that child like right away in, in the possession of somebody like you, please pull a vehicle over that's just grabbed her and put her in there. Chances of finding the child alive are not very good. So it's now been a month. Let me just give you the basics on this. Uh, Summer Wells disappeared on June 15th in Hawkins County in Rogersville, Tennessee. Uh, she's five years old. And yeah, so it's been... See June 15th. I got, I got to do my, yeah, it's just a little over. What day is it? <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. Let me look. Oh, okay. So it's just a month. It's a July 18th. So it's just a few, couple days over a month. Chances are she's not going to be found alive if she was kidnapped by a pedophile. So that's not good news. Um, and again, she's not likely to have been taken by somebody who wants to, um, love and love and care for her and, and raise her as their own daughter. That's unlikely. And there's some really strange theories going around. I'll show you one of the strange theories going around, which is the ones I'm trying to get rid of. She, uh, the, the family attends a church, a seventh day Adventist church. And, and you see this, is this up above me, that is Shannon and she's hugging. Um, this is her, this is her Sabbath uh, teacher at the church. Um, let me see if I'm fine. I'm not, I'm not I'll not give her a name. Uh, it, it's the Sabbath teacher. And obviously she really, really likes her. And you can see that in the video, which unfortunately people are taking, going through all the videos of the church and pointing people out and saying that maybe that guy took her, maybe she took her, maybe it's kind of very creepy. Um, and she's, and, and, and but she's playing with the, uh, the, the teacher's hair and she, then the teacher finally tries to get her to the ground and you see her in this picture. Oops, where is, uh, she's struggling to get back up. She's putting up her hands. She's trying to climb back up onto the teacher's body. Now, so the, so some people are saying, oh, well, the, the, somebody in the church has stolen her because they think the parents are lousy. So they, they snuck out there to take away uh, Shannon uh, uh, from, from, her, um, uh, from her mother and father. Uh, I mean, so, Summer, I'm sorry. Take Summer away from her mother and father. And I'm like... Really, I mean, that is an extremely unlikely scenario. Uh, you know, the, the church is there to try to support families, to try to help children. But And I'm not saying you can't get a psychopath in church. You can. But that, that people are starting to assign these really creepy personalities to everybody in the church and saying they're doing all these nefarious things. It's, it's really sad. Um, what I see here is a, is a, is a, is a, a teacher who has been very caring towards Summer and that Summer really, really likes the teacher. Now, the w w only thing that comes out that I get from this video, which is quite concerning, is a simple fact that the parents, if they're in the church, are allowing Summer to crawl all over uh, a person, uh, the te her teacher, while she's trying to sing. And it goes on and on and on. And nobody stands up and says, hey, you know, hey, kid, you can't do that. You know, you take your child down off the podium and say, you know, that's not proper behavior. That's not being done. So it shows if the parents are there at church and she wasn't, I'm not sure. I know some, I, I'm, I'm assuming they're there only because I would think of another, another family was caring for at the church. They would have pulled her off the podium. So you just wonder, 
is this a sign of neglect and a sign of I, we've kind of let her do whatever she wants to do and we, we just sometimes don't pay attention doesn't mean we don't care about her it's just we just maybe don't pay attention enough um and we'll look at that a little bit later when we're when we're looking at what actually might have happened to summer um was it a case of neglect as opposed to a case of abduction and do we see any evidence that this could be so uh, so that's, you know, some pieces of information are useful, but sometimes they just get these, these, these ideas just get really kooky, you know, just really kooky. Um, so, um, another, another one that's really kind of crazy, uh, is this one. Um, so also what, a very odd thing about this case. And so people have brought it up as a possible, oh my God, this could be, this could be happening as uh, this could be connected. Um, a, a while, a long time ago uh, was, I think, let me see what the year that was. Um, okay. Hold on a sec. Oh, Marie, uh, the sister uh, of the mother of, of uh, summer, the sister went missing in 2009 in Wisconsin. Um, and her mother is the mother of the sister, Candace Herrer, Herrer, I don't know how you pronounce her name, Herrer. Um, Candace Herrer is Rose's, that's the girl that went missing, that's her mother, but it's also Candace Bly's mother, that, who is, so she's the grandmother of Summer Wells. And she was living on the property at the time that Summer went missing. And she also was in, spent the day with uh, her daughter, Candace, and, Candace Bly and her granddaughter, Summer, they spent the day together doing errands and she had gone to the hospital to get a leg that pained her checked out and they went to the store. And so she spent the day and she was in the car with Summer as they supposedly arrived home. And then supposedly, I'll get into it later, She they were also gardening together. So she's part of the scenario today, but she also lost her daughter, her daughter, which is uh, Candace Bly's sister, in 2009 and she just disappeared um to, got in her car and just and went off and then her car was found and she was never found um <clears throat> there's some suspicion on the husband uh and he never did get convicted of this crime um but he was a definitely a person of interest and a good person of interest and so there are people going oh my god these cases they might be connected no they're not connected this is just makes no sense that they would be connected. It's a, it's weird that, you know, a mother has lost now, has daughter, a grandma, oh, well, let me, let me get the name straight. They're, they're all called Candace. It's weird. So, so Summer's grandmother lost a daughter and then that grandmother lost her grandchild. So odd that two, two disappearing people in the same family. Yes. Bad luck, perhaps. Um, but are they connected? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't see any evidence of that whatsoever. So let's, let's get rid of that concept. Now let's take a look at what could have happened, uh, and what the police have to look at in this particular case, the things that are truly, truly important. And, and I say, get away from a lot of, um, <laughs> what was this? We call her Grandis. <laughs> this is funny. Bella says we call her Grandis because there's a lot of Candaces. That's a great idea, Grandis and Candace. I like that. It's it, it, somebody pointed out it was very unusual that daughters get named like almost like juniors, you know, Candace Senior or Junior. But for some reason in this family, they did do that, and um, so yes, it's confusing. So I'm, I like Grandis, Grandis and Candace. That's that's a pretty good idea. Um, so. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into all these things. There's lots of these questions, like Desiree asked, according to what we know, the brothers were the last to see her. It would be easy to, for the police to get truth from the boys. Okay, and, and why? what about the abductor and the barking dog possibilities? Okay, let's take a look at actually where they lived and what supposedly happened, okay? So, because that's important for anybody who's not totally familiar with this as to what happened. Let's look at where they live, first of all. Um, they lived in a very isolated spot in Tennessee. Um, I'm going to start, I'll start by panning out first. So this, oops, that's not it. I'm sorry, that's a swimming hole. No, that is it. Okay, this, this is where, okay, so if you take a look at that, look, look at 
look at that house and look at all those trees around there. I mean, it's way off the main road. Um, there is not a neighbor next door. So you have to go, somebody coming up to that property has to drive up or have to park someplace and then, and then, then walk up. But it's, it's, it's fairly isolated. It's, it really is. And uh, here's another, here's another view of it. This is the, this is the house. The actual house is behind me. And that the small one you see behind that, the white one is the trailer that Grandis, which I love this new name, Grandis, the grandmother, Candace, lived in that trailer. So it's like a mother-in-law house. Uh, and this is very important to pay attention to where the house is and where the trailer is, because that, that means something. And then let me show you where the, 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 the bottom of the house is. So when I show you the story um, or relate the story, or I'll let maybe the parents just relate the story. Um, th this is a porch. And so the grandmother's over there and, and the little girl Summer goes into the house and down into the basement. And then there's this door down here. And she could theoretically just go out the door or somebody could come in that door. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the layout of the, uh, the, whole, the whole place. So now let's take a listen to what the father says and what the mother says um, about this the, the child going missing. Um, let's go first to, oh, I'm having issues here today. I'm not, having weird, uh, you know, you know, I always have these like these, these gremlins. Oh, I never even asked you. You are, I, apparently you are actually hearing me, which is good. <laughs> and last, last week we had some, some gremlin that just completely distorted the, the visual and, 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 and audio. And I, talked to StreamYard and they said it was it was just a glitch. So I'm hoping that we don't see that again today, but I forgot to ask. So, oops. Anyway, <laughs> I'll move along here. So let's take a look at what the mother and father said. We'll start with dad. She was planting flowers with her mother and her grandmother and she wanted to go into the house. So my wife watched her go into the door and she went into the house and the boys were on the internet, of course. And she wanted to go downstairs and play with her toys. So when her mother come in, she says, we're summer. She went down in the basement. She didn't answer, so she went down there, and she was gone. So she went out the basement door, which was unlocked, and we haven't seen her since. Okay, so the thing about Dad is he was not there as far as we know, as far as the, all the information goes. He was... You hear that meowing? Now I got a cat bothering me. Sorry, I have to kick the cat away. <laughs> Go away, it's furry. Um, and it's and it's hot in here, and it's wanting to mess with my legs. Um, it usually stays away during my show, so I don't know why it's changed its mind today. Anyway, um, so the dad was supposedly at work uh, when Candace Bly, uh, Summer's mother, called him to say, "Hey." Summer's missing. And then supposedly they both called 911. And that was so, again, was supposedly around 6.30. Um, and uh, there's a, also confusions about that, about what 911 said happened. They said that the, they were called and they were told that the mother had taken a walk. And when she came back, Summer was missing. But that's not supposedly the story. And, and the parents deny that. Now, the father, he's telling the story straight up because he wasn't there. As far as we know, he was not there. Um, and he's repeating the story his wife told him. And so I don't, uh, you know, I, he's telling what he heard. Now, does he know more? In other words, do, is he suspicious of things uh, that maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't an abduction. Maybe something happened in the home. Maybe his wife is responsible for his daughter going missing. He claims no, but there are some indications that he's quickly accepted that his daughter is dead and he has spoken in the past tense about her. So people have said, you know, that's a little suspicious. Um, so next I'm going to show you the, the mother's statement because I think that's of more importance than the, than the father's statement. My mother and her were planting flowers and we went in after we got done washing our hands and she got a piece of candy from grandma and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay, and I walked her all the way over to the porch and I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer, I'll be back. And within two minutes I came back and I asked the boys where their sister was and they said, 
She went downstairs, Mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay. And I yelled downstairs for her a couple times, and I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. Okay, now, as a profiler, I find her statement very interesting for a number of reasons. And let me explain that some people don't agree with me. Um, uh, let me point out, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a, um, a YouTube channel. It's called, well, it's called body language. Um, and these are these, uh, this is what's the actual name of it. It's called actually called the behave, <clears throat> sorry, the behavior panel. <clears throat> there are four behavioral experts. Uh, it's these guys. They're four behavioral experts. Um, and what they did was go through the entire videos and each one of them comments on what they see as, as, uh, as body language to tell them whether the person is telling the truth or whether they're lying. And they kind of give like a percentage, I think 90% chance that, that they're telling the truth. Now, um, I find it very interesting. Let me tell you a little bit about the, that kind of analysis. Um, there's, there's a bunch of anal way you would analyze what people say. Uh, these are, they're using totally behaviors, um, whether their eyebrows go up, uh, whether they, they shake their head the wrong direction when they're saying something that they should be saying yes. So they're going like this at the same time. Um, whether they're smirking, whether they're looking the wrong direction. And this has come from behavior. This kind of uh, studying body language comes from many, 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 you know, people doing research, you know, uh, into people doing this kind of thing. And it's very interesting. Um, and by the way, you know, a lot of people got, I saw a little upset with me because I have some YouTube channels that I say, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with what they're doing because I find them to be grifters and make taking advantage of cases and just, you know, doing 20, 30 videos on it and bringing you know, people in to make money off of them. And I don't find their stuff terribly valuable. I find them more of a problem. Now, these guys, these guys are all professionals. And also, let me just say, I don't have a problem with lay people doing stuff. And some lay people, maybe they haven't you know, had a 20 or 30 year career in law enforcement or in, in psychology, but they're really smart. I don't have any problem with them having a channel. That's not my issue. It's, it's grifting and taking money from people for, you know, being sneaky and manipulative. Um, these, these four guys, their channel is, I like what they do. And the reason I like what they do is they're an educational channel in that they explain what they, what they, what they're saying. In other words, if they say, well, I think, this shows deception. They will explain why they think it shows deception. Now, I don't have to agree with that. You don't have to agree with that. You know, another another expert may disagree with that. But the fact is, they're they're um, explaining why they think certain things. So we can learn from that. We can learn how how they do their work, why they come to their conclusions. Um, <clears throat> so I find I find it very interesting. Uh, and. They, they, these four guys believe that the parents are telling the truth, all four of them. And I was kind of surprised that they didn't have more issues. Um, so uh, is it because they are telling the truth or is it because for some reasons uh, they see it, you know, they don't, they just, just didn't catch the deception. Now, uh, there's another kind of, um, uh, a methodology of analyzing what people say, and it's called statement analysis. And one of my favorite guys is in a guy called Peter Hyatt. He does great statement analyses. Um, and what he does, he isn't into some. He does some of the behavior, but mostly he takes the statements and he analyzes the words in the statements. That when people use certain words, like for for me, I love the word just. When people start saying just, there's usually a lie coming right after it. I don't know why, but it just, okay, there comes a lie. Um, I just went home. No, you didn't. Um, so there's these, these ways that we speak, which lead, you know, can tell us whether you're telling the truth or not, or at least indicate. And I say indicate because it's not 100% that you can prove that. And the reason you can is because people come from different cultures. They have different they have different ways of speaking and sometimes they incorporate things into the speech, which you do not recognize as normal for them. So you have to get what's called a baseline. In other words, if you knew what that person was like and how they spoke previously, then you'd catch the change 
if they change something or if, if you know what the truth is, how they do the truth, then you know when they're lying. Uh, that's kind of the idea of a polygraph. When you start a polygraph, you do the same thing. You ask them a bunch of questions that they can't screw up. Like, is your name Joe Brown? And the person says, yes, and it's perfectly fine. And then they ask you some question like, you know, is your name Mary Smith? And it's like, no, and that's perfect. Or if you said yes to that, it would go because you're lying because you know you're not Mary. Um, so you get a baseline and then you move on to asking questions. So you have to make sure you have a baseline. I don't know what the baseline for the parents in this particular case are. Um, you know, how do they talk normally, uh, you know, on a regular basis? Also, we have to worry about, you know, are they drugged up? You know, uh, especially parents who have lost a child. Um, they're on a lot of drugs. Sometimes they're on drugs before they lost a child, which is why they lost the child. <laughs> but oftentimes they're also on drugs after they lost the child because they're so they're so depressed and they're so they can't function. So they take things. And some people think that Summer's mother looks like she's kind of stoned, and she may be. Uh, and you know, that can that can influence what you say. And there's other reasons why you can come across as truthful when you're. And I'll tell you one of those in a minute, uh, because that's kind of what I think may be the issue here. Now. Let me go back to um, how do you, who do you believe type of thing. Okay, so these four guys, by the way, they also did um, um, a behavioral analysis of the Madeleine McCann case of the parents of Madeleine McCann who went missing. Uh, so it's very similar in, in a way to Summer. Uh, you know, little Madeleine McCann went missing while the parents were on vacation, and they say they the child was abducted, and there's many people who think her parents were involved in what happened. Um, they think all four of them think that the McCann's telling the truth. Interesting enough, Peter Hyatt, who I have great respect for, for doing his statement analysis, says McCann's are not telling the truth. <laughs> who do you believe? And here's the thing. This is why I believe that all of these methodologies belong in the investigative stage. Um, you're, these are to help the police figure out leads. Which way should we look? Um, I personally am in Peter Hyatt's camp. With the, with the McCann case, I do not believe that they're being that they're being truthful. I disagree with these guys, and I happen to think I disagree with them on this one too. It doesn't mean I disrespect them. I I like because what they're doing is they're explaining everything that they're saying, so you can think for yourself. Okay, that's very interesting. They're saying this. Let me learn. Let me learn from that. I think that's really great. Um, and by the way, I just while I'm while I'm at it, just so I want to point out a couple other uh, up other uh, YouTube channels, which do not offend me. <laughs> um, there's a guy named Dr. Todd Grand. He is a mental health counselor and he talks about a lot of cases. Um, he he's very, 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 very calm when he talks about the cases. But he, what I like about him is that he explains why he came to his conclusions. And he's also not a grifter. He's not He's not asking for money every three seconds. You know, he does support himself with Patreon, which is perfectly reasonable because he's doing a lot of work. Um, another one who's very well known is the one called Profiling Evil. It's done by Mike King. He, um, he is really well connected to media. So he's got all the support in the world for putting on, you know, podcasts and YouTube. He's making a lot of money, but he is capable. Um, and, and has something to offer, I think. He's a longtime law enforcement guy. He's a co-chair of the FBI's VICAP. He's, he's an author. Uh, and I just I just realized he wrote uh, a book on who killed King Tut. And he was uh, that was published by Prometheus. And oddly enough, I wrote a story about who killed Cleopatra. And it was also published by Prometheus. So he um, he's very he, he's very successful, extremely successful. Again, I don't always agree with his methodology. Um, but he doesn't agree with mine either, probably. <laughs> but the point being, I explain my methodology, he explains his methodology, and you can learn from that. And that's the thing I think is valuable. Okay, so now these guys have thought that the, the parents were perhaps truthful. Now, let me tell you what my problems I have. I have a number of problems. And my methodology is this. Okay, let me try to explain where I come from in this methodology. Uh, I don't do just body language and I don't do just statement analysis. What I do is a totality of evidence. I look at everything together and say, what doesn't make sense here and what does make sense here? One of the things that doesn't make sense here is the two minutes that, that Candace talks about. 
the two minutes in which her daughter went missing in the middle of absolute isolation. In other words, we've looked at that area of the house, right? Not much around there. And as somebody just pointed out, the dogs weren't, there were not barking dogs. Nope. She didn't say she heard a car, a vehicle. So in that two minutes, and by the way, yeah, so it's two minutes. In two minutes, somebody supposedly accessed the house. Somebody silently snuck up on the house. Now, first of all, they have to know, since they were out a good portion of the afternoon, how did they even know the child was home? How did they know where the child was in the house? Why would you, if their people had were home, including three boys who aren't necessarily going to be in the exact location at the same time, uh, and there's a parent, a mother and a grandmother. So there's five people besides Summer in that house or around that house. Do you honestly think somebody's going to try to sneak up there with all those people running around? That's insane. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's just that that's not the way an abductor works. I mean, it's crazy. Now, only thing that could happen in those two minutes was that literally Summer went out the door and raced away from the house. And lo and behold, the predator was out there in the bushes and was able to pull her away. Could that have happened? Yes, she could have. She, she, that, that she was watched so closely all the time is unlikely. They're in the middle of nowhere. You get kids five years old. She goes out and plays on her swing and she runs around the house. And I'm sure nobody's paying attention to every second of her life. Um, so she goes out and plays. And could in those two minutes she have run down the hill in spite of the fact her parents say she would never, ever, ever, ever have done that. You know, if I were them, I'd say, yeah, she does that a lot. Somebody could have grabbed her out near the bushes. But they said she didn't leave. She wouldn't go out of the house. So somebody lured her out. How in the devil do you lure a five-year-old out of the house? How do you even get there to know where she is in the basement to lure her out with what? I mean, this is a very bizarre statement that makes no sense. So what? So look at this. Look at the two minutes. Two minutes. Now, I have a problem with the entire statement of the mother about how she handled things. And here is why I think it's so weird. Let's look, let's look back at, let's look back at the picture of the house and where they were. Now they're supposedly out here, supposedly that this is a kind of weird thing. People pointed this out and I don't, I don't you know, I just don't know. This is, they're supposedly planting flowers, but all you see is a bunch of cactus in a, in a pot. So <laughs> I'm not sure what the heck they were planting flowers there, but okay. So here is, that's let me want, I want to point out that, let's see, what's the best picture of this? Is it this picture? Okay. See, see where that, um, see where that trailer is. It's here. Basically there's a little dirt road and then the porch is here. It's not very far, <laughs> really not far. And yet the mother, she says after they finished, they planted these flowers and, for some reason, you no, know, Summer wants to go see her brothers. Okay. Um, and so she has to wash her hands first, which I'm assuming is inside the trailer. And her grandmother gives her a piece of candy, which is interesting. Okay. And then, then the mother watches her, watches her walk. Actually, in one place she said watches, and then she says she walks her daughter over there. Like it's far away. I mean, really? Okay, you want to go see your brothers? Go. I mean, honestly, as a grandparent, I wouldn't have watched her walk across into the house. What the heck? I mean, or I wouldn't have to accompany her. I just let her go into the darn house. Now, you already know your three, the three boys are in there. Is it really necessary if you're going to be there in two minutes? If your plan is to be there, you're just like, I don't know, maybe you're just picking up a couple of items and then walking over to the house. Do you really need to go when she runs in that door and sees her three brothers there. Do you really need to go in and tell the three brothers, watch Summer, I'll be back. What, in two minutes, you need them to watch Summer? She's five years old. She's she's not a one-year-old. She's five. Five-year-olds in old days used to walk to school by themselves. You know, five-year-olds play in the backyard. Do you, I mean, watch Summer in the house. In the house, you got to watch. 
Well, they actually didn't, apparently. Supposedly, they said, yeah, we didn't watch her at all. She just went downstairs to play with the toys, and we paid no attention to her. So <laughs> I don't know how that was watching. But what, what was the point of saying you got to watch her? It's like overkill. So if we go back to the, the interesting little segment at the church, which is the only reason I think it is interesting, apparently she was allowed to do whatever she kind of wanted to. How much was anybody watching her? So you're telling me in your house where nobody is around you, no cars have come up the driveway, you got no neighbors, you have to watch your child or walk your child over to the porch and then tell the boys to watch her for two minutes? It's like... That is like most helicopter parenting I've ever seen all of a sudden. All of a sudden. It makes very little sense. So it's like she has got to prove that she did nothing wrong, that no great amount of time could have passed for something to have happened or for anybody to get rid of a body or anything. It's only two minutes. Nothing could have happened. I couldn't be responsible because I walked her over there, saw her go into the house, told the boys to watch her, and I was back in two minutes. Couldn't have been me. I could have nothing to do with it. Okay, that's a problem. Then I find a very strange common comment at, listen one more time to the mother's statement. Listen to the very end of the statement. My mother and her were planting flowers, and we went in after we got done washing our hands, and she had a piece of candy from grandma, and she wanted to go back over and see her brothers. And I said, okay. And I walked her all the way over to the porch. And I watched her walk into the kitchen where the boys were watching TV. And I told the boys, I said, watch Summer. I'll be back. And within two minutes, I came back. And I asked the boys where their sister was. And they said, she went downstairs, Mom, to play with her toys in the playroom. I said, okay, and I yelled downstairs for her a couple times, and I didn't get no answer, which was unusual because usually she always answers me. And so I went down there to check, and she was nowhere in sight. She was just gone. My mother. So first I want to po point out one other thing. She said, walked her all the way over. What, a few feet? That's all the way over? I mean, that is a description that doesn't match what actually could have happened. That is that any distance. She, she just took a couple steps. I mean, all the way over. She wanted to make sure everybody knew that she was being a good mother and was taking her child all the way to the house so she'd be safe. And then she says, and she was just, with big expression, she was just gone out of the playroom. Gone. Well, why would you be that surprised that she wasn't in the playroom? When you have a back door, that opens up to the yard where her swing is. Why would that be a big, huge thing? I mean, you just, okay, here, here was what I would have done. First of all, the, the boys, she went down to play with her toys. Really did, did Summer announce to her three brothers who weren't paying any attention because they were watching TV or whatever, I am going to play with my toys in the basement now. I doubt that doesn't make any sense. So anyway, she goes down. I, I as a mother, come in. I walk in, I go, where's Summer? And they go, she's in the hall, she's downstairs. I go, okay, Summer, Summer. I go downstairs, if there's any, you know, to check on her and she's not there and I go, what the heck? Where is she? She's not in here, okay. I open the back door, walk out, Summer, Summer. Now, where is she? Is she over? I go over to Summer. I'm not panicked at this point. Why would I be panicked that she's not in the basement? She's five years old. Why do I not think she's outside playing? That she, say there's dogs there. My granddaughter runs out to play with dogs all the time. I mean, she likes her dog. She runs around the yard with the dogs. She goes, she has a rabbit. She goes and she goes and plays with the rabbits. I don't, if I didn't see her in the room, I wouldn't go, oh my God, she's been kidnapped. She's just gone. No, I go, well, where is she? And I'd walk outside and go yell her name. And I'd go around the house and I'd go look at the rabbit cage. And then I'd go, oh, there you are, you know. You know, it, it makes no sense that she is so astounded her daughter is not downstairs in the basement. That to me is a massive red flag. I can't, I can't get by that. So I've got a bunch of problems with the statement. And for me, it's not behavior. It's not the actual statement of the words. It's the fact that none of it makes sense. 
that it's overkill for her saying she did all these things to make sure her daughter was so safe <laughs> when she's right there at home. Uh, it's overkill that she had to walk all the way to the house from right, right there. Uh, it's overkill that when she found her daughter not in the basement, she was just gone. You know, it's overkill. She should have just been, oh, she must be outside playing with the dogs or something, playing, picking some flowers. I don't know. That's all overkill. Why is that necessary? So question comes down to what actually happened. Now there's the, the day, the day as it's explained, she, she, they went off in, in the earlier part of the day. It's, it's unquestionable that summer was perfectly fine. Uh, summer, uh, Candace took summer and they went to end the grandmother and they were going to the hospital. So the grandmother gave her, I guess her, her knee looked out cause it hurt. And they stopped and picked up this 15 year old boy who was a friend of the family. He'd been a friend for a long time. He called her auntie. Now there's a lot of people who think there's some kind of weird stuff going on between the two of them. I'm not going to go there. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's necessary uh, because as far as I can see, after she, after they did their thing and they went swimming at the swimming hall, and they went swimming at this, you know, nice little place near where they're picking up the medication for the grandmother at, at Walgreens. Um, everybody was in the car, as far as I know. There's, there's, Candace was in the car. The grandest was in the car next to her, and in the back seat was the 15 year old boy, and and um, Summer, and they were all then headed home. And at that point, there's this this famous picture of. Uh, of, of uh, Summer who had falling asleep in the car. Where is she falling asleep in the car? Where is she asleep in the car? There she is. Okay. Now she's supposedly, they've gone to, they've picked up the medication. She's already been swimming. They picked up the medication and now she's falling asleep, you know, laying across the seat, sort of just fell asleep on top of the, the milk jugs. And a lot of people are saying, oh my God, she's dead. And, and you know, the boy was in the car, 15 year old boy is in the car as well. And the grandmother. So, they're saying that when she went swimming at the swimming hole, this was what I was putting up picture before. This is a swimming hole near Walgreens. And so it's a nice little place. You just, you know, you see her, she's on TikTok, just splashing around. Some people think she slipped under the water and, and the boy picked her, pulled her out. And then she somehow got water in her lungs and eventually died of, I don't know, dried, eventually they said dried drowning on the way home. I mean, it's, it's all, all concocted stuff. Essentially, they went swimming, then they left, they picked up the, the, the medications, and they went to the store, they got some groceries, and then they dropped the boy, 15-year-old boy off. And at the time they dropped the 15-year-old boy off, she was sleeping in the back seat, and, um, and then the grandmother was still in the car. And there's another video where the grandmother, acts, this is where the picture comes from, the grandma's trying to take a picture, so supposedly she had her hand in a funny position, and the grandma's like, oh, that's so cute, and, uh, and took that little tiny little video. Um, I don't think, you know, it's, it looks very innocent. So it appears that after she, there was, she was dropped, the boy was dropped off and they're on their way home. And I think this is about the, the picture was taken. Let me see when the picture was taken. 2.30, they dropped off the young boy at his house. And at 3.09, the photo of Summer in the car, that's 3.09. And supposedly somewhere around 5.30, and I, I don't get the between the 5.30 and the 6.30 thing. Uh, supposedly she went missing. So another two, two and a half hours. So anyway, the grandmother's in the car, Candace is in the car, the mother, and Summer, and she's asleep, and they get home, they go home. Now there's a lot of unaccounted for time at this point. And this is, this is where I become concerned about the unaccounted time. So, and I become concerned about this. And that's why I pointed out the grandmother before. Candace Herr, okay. Um, the problem I have with Candace Herr is this. Her daughter went missing in 2009 and is assumed dead. And, and they say the, the husband ex has, was a good suspect, still a good suspect, um, assumed dead. Never body, never found. Now her granddaughter goes missing. Has anybody seen her in public making a statement? Now, supposedly she made one quick statement to the police and um, and it was not a very, it wasn't, it wasn't a long statement, a tiny, well, a public, now she made one little tiny public statement. And what amazes me is that she's already got a missing child, one missing daughter. And she's involved with some missing children's stuff, missing people's stuff um, in Wisconsin. 
I seen on I've seen her Facebook page. She's got some, you know, missing children's things. She puts other other missing pil uh, missing children pictures up, but she's not very vocal about her missing granddaughter. Not very vocal. Now I've been around a lot of families. You know, I can't imagine this grandmother would not be shouting to the hills about her missing granddaughter that somebody stole her missing granddaughter, abducted like my grand my other daughter. I've now I've lost a daughter and a granddaughter. She's been abducted that she would be out in public supporting her daughter, supporting her son-in-law, so trying to find out who took her granddaughter. She's very silent, very quiet. And that makes me wonder because here is, a, here is also a reality of how people behave. And I've worked cases like this. You have cases where one child kills another child. A family has two children. I call them Cain and Abel stories. So Cain kills Abel. Um, and then the parents won't believe that Cain killed Abel because if they do, they lose both children. So they throw all the support behind Cain because he's the one that's left. And they say, he didn't do it, he didn't do it. And then when they find out he did do it, they still keep their support behind him. He was psychologically disturbed or whatever. Um, and they, they, they'll, they'll visit him in prison and do everything they can for that still alive child. So Grandis here, has already lost one daughter. She only has one daughter left, as far as I know, Candace. If something happened, Candace was responsible for something that happened to the granddaughter. It makes sense to me that a grandmother who's already been through this may be doing the Cain and Abel thing, and she's gonna save the one daughter she's got left, and she's gonna save the three grandson she has left because once she if she speaks up if, if she knows something and speaks up against her own daughter she not only loses her daughter she loses pretty much it's a, it's a disaster is what it is and so is she is she quiet because she knows something and she doesn't want to talk about it um so so that's 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 an interesting problem which i have trouble getting by um so then, so then the question would be, when did things happen? When did things really happen? If, if the family was involved, if Candace Bly was involved, when did things really happen? Now, one of the reasons the, um, that, that panel may have found her not to be deceptive may be that she was relating a story that happened earlier in the day. This is a great way not to be deceptive. So in other words, maybe some of that did happen, but maybe it happened two hours earlier. Maybe when they arrived home at 3.15 or 3.30 or whatever, they got out and they were doing some things and then they decided to plant some stuff and then she ran into the house and something, and that all happened two hours prior. So you can tell the story because the story is close to the truth, but it didn't happen when you say it happened. So there may be the fact that there's two hours of downtime that was unaccounted for, and that's that's the question. Now, there's a couple other little statements I think were, were interesting. Um, here, let me let me say this statement. Father says Don Wells says when he arrived home from work, he found the neighbors combing the property, and I knew right then and there that she was gone, gone, because she would never leave there on her own. Somebody had taken her. Well, somebody might have taken her off the property. It doesn't mean it was a stranger abduction. And she might have been gone. Gone is a euphemism often for dead. Um, in the Madeleine McCann case, that was a, 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 st a statement that was made that was very interesting, interesting that the word gone was used as opposed to abducted. Um, so she could have been gone and then removed from the property. Somebody had taken her from the property. Um, so that's... And then there's this weird, she's possibly barefoot, which I do not understand why you need to mention that. That's kind of weird. Um, uh, and then there's supposedly, finally they're saying there's some truck in the area, but it was just so vaguely in the area, it doesn't mean a lot. Um, but there we have, that's my problem. Oh, and this, oh, here's another interesting thing. Candace gave the exact time earlier of swimming and returning home, but later she says she can't remember because she was trying to have fun. I don't know why I'm trying to have fun. I don't know how you're trying to have fun when you're doing errands, but that's kind of weird. 
you're trying to have fun so you can't remember. So that's something fishy about that as well. Um, and so did things happen at the time Candace Bly says they happened or did they happen earlier and then there's two hours unaccounted for? Did something happen in those two hours to, to the child? Um, because originally it was said that she went for a walk and something happened. So, you know, and then she said, no, 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 I never went for a walk. I don't walk because I'm scared of coyotes and I'm scared of snakes. And you know, you live in the woods, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but I find it a little hard to believe you're that freaked by everything around you when that is exactly where you live. I mean, at that point, you might as well sell your house and move into the city. But, you know, that that in the middle of the day, you're concerned about you can't take a, the smallest walk down the street because you're going to have what a coyote is going to attack you. I mean, that's just, that's nonsense. You've lived around there long enough to know if you walk down a dirt road, you know, unless there's a rock with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, a rattlesnake sitting on top of it or copperhead, you know, you can walk down a road perfectly fine. Nothing's going to happen. Bears don't usually jump out and attack you. Uh, you know, you've lived there long enough and that's not happened to you. So it's nonsense. Um, so her, her, her statements that, Oh, well, I wouldn't have taken a walk. Well, You've never taken a walk around your property ever. <laughs> I find that hard to believe. So the, so all of her behavior and her statements and the, the area and the time frame, when you put everything together, that's when I come up with, I'm having problems here. I'm having problems with that. She disappeared in two minutes that you were, you, that you were, so absolutely over, you know, helicopter mothering her all the way into the house that she was shocked that she was missing out of the basement. And, and you're, you knew she was gone right then. And rather than look around the house where she's clearly run around before without supervision that you thought, even though you never heard a car that some, and you never heard the dogs bark, you would assume somebody kidnapped her. Why would you assume that? I mean, as a parent, the first thing I would think if I never heard anything in that location, I'd assume she wandered off into the woods and got, got lost because she was chasing a dog or chasing an animal, I would assume she w walked off into the woods, even if I thought, oh, she's not what she likes to do. But really, I mean, do I think that somebody just popped out of nowhere in those two minutes and kidnapped her? No, I would, that wouldn't be my first thought. Now, if we could, couldn't find her body, then I maybe start questioning that. But that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so there's too much that doesn't make sense about the two minutes, the location. Uh, the statements, the, her shock at her being not in the basement, which I'm sure many times she's gone out that back door. Um, and there's unaccounted time, which I've never heard about all the unaccounted time. So, so people are going to ask, why? What about those three boys? Do don't they know something? And you would think so. And 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 actually, when I saw the father with one of the boys, when he was doing his uh, uh, one of his statements, he had his hand arm around his boy and. Um, and the and the, the 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 behavior the behavior group was saying, oh, he's so he looks very concerned. I thought the kid looked miserable. I thought he was holding on to him kind of strongly, like, you know, cooperate, cooperate. You know, like you don't want to lose your mother, cooperate. I mean, I don't know. And that's it's a weird thing. Um, didn't didn't sit right with me. Uh, so is abduction possible? It's possible, and this is what the, this is what the police have to deal with, because I am going to say that the police um, are going to are, are dealing with the fact that they don't see any sign of an abduction, and they 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 are probably concerned about some of these things that I'm talking about that they that they think the same way I do. I'm not saying they do. Uh, they may think differently. They may they may be following a number of different leads, but the simple fact is. These are concerning things. And, and you know, um, I'm going to say maybe somebody else noticed those things, too. And they have to they they want to talk to those three boys because what did happen for those all those hours in between when they arrived home and she supposedly went missing? Um, where was Summer all that time? Um, where was the mother all that time? Uh, and of course, they've got they've got so many people there they can talk to. First of all, they got too many people for an abductor. The three boys, Candace and Grandis, they got five of them. For an abductor to come in under those conditions, unlikely. And they've all, but that also means they have five people who know maybe what happened. And can they get one of them to finally break? Maybe. That's a good question. And, and who knows what? So 
One of the problems is if, if she's not on the property, where is she? Well, that's where the time frame comes in too, because if you if you can get everybody to believe there's only a two minute time frame, well, obviously you can't do anything. But if something happened to her, and there's a two hour time frame, and your walk wasn't really a walk, but was a drive, and you could get back into your vehicle and drive away and then come back and then claim things happened, you got two hours to work with. Uh, so this is what the, the police are gonna look at. Um, Ah, Bella Lugosi says, I love Peter, H Peter Hyatt. Yeah, I agree. Peter, Peter's great. That's my, this is my basic, uh, if somebody, have, if anybody has any questions now, um, please, this is the time to ask. You, uh, Car Carol's saying the mother sounded too calm. There's, this is interesting. The mother, you don't see a lot of crying. You don't see her freaked out. You do see her talk in the past tense all the way through. And, you know, the father does that too. And he, he really, people are saying things. He goes, oh, I never did it again. I, you know, they're going to say I talked in the past tense. But the mother really talked in the past tense all the way through very early on. And that means to me that she knows her daughter's not alive. And that is very unusual. If you truly be, believe your daughter's been abducted, you will hang on to the thought that she's alive no matter what. You know, even if she's being in a basement being tortured, you still hope somehow, some way, we're going to find my daughter and we're going to save her and we're going to somehow make her whole again. It, 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 you know, we're, she's not, she's not dead. She's not dead. She's alive, but that is not the way the mother sounds when she talks about it. It sounds like she's pretty sure she's dead. The father does say she's probably dead, which is, you know, as a profile, I'm going to agree with him, but as a father, I don't know that I'd go there. So, Oh, that's very nice of you. Alice Nurse says, I'm so glad to see someone fair and balanced covering this case. Thank you. I, I try to be. Um, oh, that's, that's an interesting point. Red rum. Uh, body language is about clusters, never one thing on its own. Yeah, you know, body language is it's it's very interesting. I, and I'm not sure I buy into all of it. I do buy into some of it. And again, I say, you got to have a baseline. And you have to know how people normally react. Like, people say I'm a snide person. <laughs> and snarky <laughs> okay <laughs> and i have a black sense of humor okay like i i can't i can't disagree with them <laughs> that is true so even in horrible situations it's not, it's not unlikely that i would say something snide and snarky so the, the then people would say see she doesn't care but it isn't that i don't care it's that i do have that personality that is who i am um now if i was a oh how can i say this I had a friend once, she's the sweetest person. Oh my God, she's so sweet. Um, and she makes doilies. I mean, like beautiful doilies and pretty things for the house. And like she crochets and stuff, you know? And she's just the nicest person ever. And she never makes like, you know, she never does like stink eye and stuff like that. You know, she's just really nice. If all of a sudden she starts acting differently like me, then I say, what the heck is wrong with her? Now, if I start acting really super sweet, something's wrong with me. <laughs> this is not me. Uh, so you just have to, you have to know. And, and culturally, there's, there truly are cultural issues. And, and this has been a problem in this case, too, um, that people are saying that pe people aren't being too nice about this couple because they're rural people. Um, they're kind of being rude about them because they're saying they're, you know, I don't know, you know, country folk and they're not that smart and they're just, you know, one of, you know and they're, they're, they're sort of dissing them for who they are. Uh, and, and, they're, and, and a slightly perhaps rough lifestyle. The uh, father has, to, has criminal history. There's some domestic abuse issues. Um, maybe, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not, it's not the, the family is, you know, they are what they are, you know, um, so, but you know, I, I don't know that that's meaningful and, and, and is necessary to, to talk down about somebody because they have a different lifestyle, uh, because they're poor or they are, they come from a criminal background. Now, having said that, these things can play into things and you have to look at where they come from, what they, what their behaviors are, and then, you know, what their behaviors are. Uh, have they changed and this does that indicate something so that's concerning oh yes this is um yeah bell says i wish we could hear the 911 call instead of the dispatcher relaying it you know the 911 call um pointing that out 
911 calls are great. And I'm going to do a show in the future that ha features a 911 calls, one of the most important things. Usually what happens on 911 calls, the first thing a person says is the most important thing. That's what they want you to know. If the first important thing is I, I went out for a walk, they want you to know you were out walking and weren't there for whatever happened. And then the next thing is and when I got back, because I want to be sure you know that they got back and you had nothing to do with anything, my daughter was gone. For example, I'm, I, that, I don't know if that has anything to do with this, what was said. But the most important thing is, what, what do they say first? So you'll find a lot of 911 calls. It's fascinating that a lot of times when ki people are murdered or, you know, there's like supposedly a carjacking, that first thing common isn't, oh, my, 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 my child's lying on the, on, the, on the pavement bleeding to death. It's something like, a guy came up to my car and pointed a gun in my face. And I tried to stop him and he hit me and I got a bruise on my face. Oh, and by the way, my kid's lying on the sidewalk dying. <laughs> you know, he was like, wasn't that the most important thing you should have said? First of all, you know, so the 911 call is very interesting that they, again, let me, let me say about this, about what releasing stuff. They don't have to release a 911 tape. Um, they have no reason to. And here's the reason they don't have to do that. When I talk about police, should give information to the public. The only information the police should give to the public is something that will sp specifically help them identify a person who committed a crime. When it's serial killers, I say all the time, police need to give more information up to begin with. If the person was stabbed to death with a, with a butcher knife, tell the public this, because the, the killer already knows you know it's a butcher knife. You know, it's not a big secret. Tell the public it's a butcher knife so that they can identify a person who might have been you know, borrowed a butcher knife or throw away a butcher knife. Um, but you don't need to give information to the public about how many stabs the butcher knife made because that you do want to keep for the interview. So when the guy says, I stabbed her 18 times, that you don't, there's no need, you know, that would be good information to know that the guy's telling the truth. The public isn't going to help you if you tell them it was 18 times stabbed. They're just going to go, oh my God, she got stabbed 18 times. Oh, how creepy. No, that doesn't help anything. The 911 tape, unless unless it's going to say something which will help the public identify that the person is lying. And I don't mean by speculation. Now that sounds like a lie to me. I don't mean that. Like if the person says, I was at, hmm, I was at the gas station at six o'clock and then I came home. But in reality, they weren't at the gas station at six o'clock. And somebody says, well, that's not true. She was at my house at six o'clock. Or I saw her drive by at, at you know, at way earlier than six o'clock. That's a lie. So unless the public can give you information, they don't need to release it. I've seen too many 911 tapes released so that the, the, the public can just be you know, all like, oh, isn't that, oh, it's a baby. It's, some of it's just really sad. Uh, and it really annoys me. Um, oh, look, Red Rum says, <laughs> I made it here live. Hi. <laughs> that is so nice. Oh, yes, this is also a good point. Um, the house is at the top of a steep hill. Yeah, um, which again, it's kind of a, like a lookout thing. You can see downwards and you have to think in the mind of a predator. You know, predators like things that are easy. Uh, they want to get away with it. I mean, let me let me think about this. So I'm down here, the bottom of the hill going, okay, <laughs> I'm going to walk up the hill. Then I'm going to like, like what? What am I going to do to sneak into this house to get this kid where I don't even know where the kid is? Because two minutes ago, that kid wasn't in that basement, was she? She was over at grandma's. So what am I going to do? How am I going to get her? I, mean, I say the whole thing makes absolutely zero sense. And when you, when you look at the way people actually behave, oh, <laughs> this is Candace has a daughter named Candace too. So three Candaces. Yeah. It's very confusing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the grandest thing just because I can't, I can't get it through my own head. So um, let's see what everybody else has to say here. Um, oh, Jan says, I watched the behavior panel. I was surprised by their interpretations. I do not agree with everything they said. Yeah, I don't either. But I'll give them credit for explaining everything they said. Because what, what the things that drive me crazy is not that we have differing opinions, uh, that we come from different backgrounds. Um, that maybe we don't even like the, <laughs> the, the our, 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 our approach to things. So we don't like our uh, another person's interpretations. My concern is, can you explain it? 
I've had a long time beef with the FBI's profiling methodology, which is one reason they don't say too many nice things about me, but I don't agree with their their methodology. Now, I, I, I will comment that I do love Robert Ressler. I think he's one of the one of the FBI profiles that really was uh, very honorable and did very good, very pretty good profiling. I, I like the guy. Uh, he's very modest too. So I like the guy, um, Robert Red, uh, Robert Ressler. Um, I almost said Robert Redford, which <laughs> was not him. Robert Ressler. Um, but I do not agree with the, what's called inductive criminal profiling. Inductive criminal profiling was something the FBI developed where they took a lot of statistics and then they started profiling by statistics. So they would say, for example, since most serial killers are between 30 and 40 years old, uh, therefore, when they came to a crime, they say the killer is 35, between 30 and 40. I'm like, you don't know that. He could be 20, he could be 50. What the heck? You do not know that. Just because statistics say 80% of them, because, you know, that's a good eight. You know, but basically speaking, when you get to that point of committing these crimes, you tend to be, in, there is a tendency to be in that category, but there's no proof of that. Um, you know, and then when you start saying things that are based on just research that says a, a percentage, whatever. So you see these inductive profiles come out where it's, you know, a 30 year old guy, white guy lives with his mother, has a dog. How do you know the guy's got a dog? Now, if there's dog hair in the car, you know, that, that the girl was killed in and she has dog hair on her body, I'm going to say the guy's got a dog. But if you don't have dog hair, how do you know the dude's got a dog? Maybe he's got a cat. I've met serial killers with cats. I have. Um, so how do you know? Maybe they don't have any pets at all. Maybe they killed all their pets, you know, <laughs> and everybody else is, you know, don't make stuff up. Don't don't. And then and then what's happened is over the years, because they, the FBI inductive method, they, they, they become because Hollywood got hold of it. A lot of the, some of the profilers of today from the FBI, ex-FBI profilers, they write so many books and they 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 do, you know, consulting with Hollywood. And they people think of them as gods, like they have this psychic ability to meld with the mind of the killer, which if you do that, you need psychiatric help. Um that is not scientific. That's, and they'll say that, oh, it's more of an art. Well, if it's an art, it's crap. You know, it should be scientific. So I use a deductive prof profiling methodology, which bases on evidence. So what I said here today, I'm not saying, because I say it's an investigative tool. I don't belong in a court of law saying this stuff. This is an investigative tool. If I was working with the police on this case, I would point out exactly what I said to you guys. I say, look, that two minute time frame does not make sense to me. Her re reaction in the basement does not make sense to me, but I'm gonna tell you exactly why. What evidence do I have to base my determination on? Here's my evidence. Here is the evidence to support what I'm saying. If I'm just going, I think she's telling a lie, <laughs> you know, I that's kind of useless. So when I talk to the police and I've done my analysis, I always support it with evidence. And then the police can read it for themselves and determine whether what I say makes sense and whether it's useful to them in pursuing their case. So the behavior panel, they ex at least, I'll give them credit, explain where they're coming from. I don't necessarily agree with all the methodology of this particular uh, tool but i appreciate that they are explaining themselves so that we can then say hmm does this make sense or doesn't make sense and then we can do further research if we're we're confused or we let's say we find out let's say this would be interesting let's say we find out that candace bly is guilty of committing a, some crime against her daughter maybe an accident or whatever and concealing evidence let's say that's true then the the group has to go well, crap, <laughs> we were wrong. So our methodology has some failures and we have to now look at that. On the other hand, what happens if it turns out she was abducted? Then Pat Brown has to say, huh, where did I go wrong? So I think it's very important that we be honest so that we can then analyze where we go wrong and where we go right so that the police themselves can do better investigative work and better analysis so that we all benefit. So, you know, if we all sit there in our little egotistical worlds, you know, we, we can't learn from that. So that, that's very important to me um, that we, 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 at least, but at least I say, at least, the behavior, at least they explain where they're getting 
where their concepts come from. And I will appreciate that. So um, let me see what else we have here. So many nice comments here. Well, this person disagrees. Hi, it's been wrong many times, pseudoscience. So, so this is, this is again, why I say, I, I, I don't know that I consider it totally a pseudoscience um, because I have seen a lot of these particular words. I have done certain statement analysis with, with suspects or even witnesses to crimes. And I've had to laugh because like I point out with the just word, man, that thing shows up all the time before the lie. It's, it's amazing. Now, again, I believe it's an investigative tool. And until you take the tool and it helps you determine where to go with your, you know, with your case. So, you, you know, cause you got to see so many avenues pick, you know, you don't want to pick every Avenue. People say, what, why don't, you know, there's all these tips coming in. Why don't you investigate every tip? Well, because you go broke doing it because you can't investigate everybody's crazy tip. You know, you can't, you just can't, you gotta be logical. You gotta say, okay, we have only so much money and so much manpower. We have to focus in on what's the most likely uh, lead to take. So you want to have the analysis be supported by evidence so that they can make the best decisions. Shouldn't be in a court of law because what you do is you take that information, Peter Hyatt's information, my information, behavior panel, whoever you wanna, you know, you're listening to them, you're trying to figure out what, what makes sense, how it's gonna help you. You pursue that line and then you get what's called absolute evidence. In other words, enough evidence to arrest and prosecute. So based on my what I've said here today, I find Candace Bly's statement extremely concerning. I find her time frame completely concerning. I find the, the impossibility of abduction from that, not impossibility, unlikelihood of abduction from that area very concerning. I would tell the police, I'm having issues with this. Does that mean Candace Bly is guilty? No, it doesn't. It means they, if I were if I were doing the analysis for them, I would say you got to lean heavy in that direction. Now, then they lean heavy. Let's say they lean heavy, and they somebody finally maybe the grandest who I think if, if she you know I find her behavior strange as well. Let's say finally she says okay, I give up. It's did something happened. Then we find what happened to Summer. We have we have confessions. We have a body. It goes to court with those things. Not my opinion. Not my analysis. My analysis may be based on evidence, but it's still my opinion, is it not? So they have to go to court with evidence that's strong enough. That's not just somebody's opinion. Now, mind you, the defense attorney and the will come in and give all kinds of weird opinions from experts who are just lying through their teeth in order to get the person off. And sometimes the prosecutors do the same thing to convict people. But in reality, you want to have solid evidence that is convincing enough to a jury to say, it's not just somebody's opinion, it's reality. Um, so that's what one wants in, in the long hand. Um, <laughs> Jan says, I don't believe the paper panel were right on the McCanns also. Okay, yeah, okay, I have issues with that. Oh, and by the way, um, just to point out about the McCanns, uh, in case you have never read my book on that, um, the one on this side, uh, profile of the disappearance of Madeline McCann, based on evidence um, pulled from Amazon by the request of the McCanns, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, there's only two books that have been, that the McCanns have wanted off the market. Uh, and, and that is um, the detective on the case. And he, he wrote a wonderful book and they pulled his book. They, they, well, it's back on the market now, but they, he, they got it pulled off the market. And then he fought for years to get it back on. And then my book was pulled off the market as well by Amazon at their request and threat of a lawsuit for, for, um, that I had uh, committed libel with this book, ah, but um, if you want to read that, it's not on, it's not on uh, Amazon, but it is at Barnes and Noble. And I, I kind of push everybody to Smashwords because they're good good to me. Smashwords, you can also get it Kobo, Apple. I don't I don't remember where it's at. It's two ninety nine. It's not going to break your bank. Um, but uh, that's another interesting one because um, again, we have a lot of people have done a lot of. Uh, um, analysis of the McCann's behavior and their statements. And one of my concerns about, again, when we do statement analysis and, and behavior analysis, we must meld it with the actual evidence. In the McCann case, no evidence of an abduction. And of course, when, we, when we're looking back at this case here today, one of the basic problems we have again is what? We have 
no evidence of an abduction at this point. Now I say at this point, and the reason I say at this point is because the police are doing an investigation and there may be new evidence come to light, which changes everything. Uh, and you say, wow, if we'd only known that, <laughs> we wouldn't have suspected these two people or this, I don't think I say the father, I think was at work, but who knows? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're the public at this point. I am, I'm not, I liked, uh, you know, there's cases I've worked on with the police and those are the cases that I can actually say, I've seen all the evidence. I know what they're looking at. And, but you know, I'm, I'm here with you on the outside on, on this particular thing. So I cannot say that everything I'm receiving as a, as also a person of the, of just and the public, um, I'm getting a thing as accurately, who knows, you know, I mean, that's, that's the problem with the, a lot of the speculation out there is it's gone off the ramps because, you know, people are coming up with every crazy idea in, in, in the world. So, um, well, Chan says, why would she ask the boys where Summer was when she just left her after two minutes? Um, yeah, why would she even ask them? I say, why would she even ask them to watch her particularly? I mean, she is five. She's not, not, not two. She's five. Five-year-olds go to school. I mean, they go to kindergarten and stuff. And they, I mean, I, I, I'm an overprotective mother. I was. I'm, I'm an overprotective grandmother. And, and, you know, but I don't see that as part of their particular past history of being overprotective. And th this is, this is important. Again, history. If I'm a detective and I'm not sitting them down and I'm interviewing different people, I'm going to ask about previous behavior because if she's all over summer all the time, making sure she knows exactly where she is every second of the day, I'm going to say, okay, maybe that two minutes is correct. But if many times she doesn't know where summer's at because, you know, she was doing whatever she was doing and summer was outside. She's like, summer, summer, where are you? And finally summer runs in from someplace. She's not an overprotective mother. And therefore, why was she so bent out of shape about these two minutes? And that's, uh, oh, I don't know. Ladybug says summer looks too active to plant flowers. I don't think so, you know. And this, is a, this, is, this is an issue. This is, again, one of the things I like to point out with people. Still photos and videos in a specific period of time do not let us know about a child or even an adult. I have a favorite picture of um, a family that was taken. And, you know, you look at this family and the father's like, and the mother's like, and the children like, and then they were murdered the next day. So daddy murdered them. And everybody looked happy till the next day. Then they looked dead. So we can't really tell. It's like it's like Facebook pages. Sometimes you can get the truth on Facebook pages. You can, If you follow a person long enough, you can sort of see who they are, depending on how honest they are. And a lot of people post a lot of bullshit. That's just fake. Uh, fake personality. They want to be perceived in a certain way. Um, so they're going to make sure they're perceived in that way. Uh, only put up pictures of the children with a big smile. They're not going to put up pictures of their children crying in a corner. But then again, let's be realistic. You know, my little granddaughter, um, her one of her little best friends is moving out of the country. Oh, my God, little brokenhearted child. I mean, just sobbing her little brains out. <laughs> you take a picture of her at that moment, you go, what is that family doing to her? They must be. They must be abusing her. Look how horribly sad she is. She's clinging to her grandmother for dear life. No, she's sad because her little friend is moving out of the country. You know, but somebody's going to misinterpret that. I mean, there are things that happen in places where, here's an example. Um, I was at, went to a church once. I won't mention which one it was. And there was a small church over here. And there was a place where the kids on the other side of the drive where, where the adults watch the children. My son was, I'm going to say three at the time. So anyway, we dropped, went to drop him off at the, which way did I put? I put the church here. I put this. Okay. So we dropped him off the little house that had the, they were watching the kids. And I said to them, looks like you don't have enough adults here. Should I stay and help you? And they said, no, we got somebody else coming here. So don't worry about it. Okay. So I dropped him off. I walked across the driveway and I'm sitting in the church. Uh, there's a window here, right? I'm sitting in the church and all of a sudden I see my little three-year-old son running down the driveway to a main road. I mean, I was freaked. I mean, I ran out of that place. I luckily caught him at the end of the driveway before he went into the road. I was pissed. I went back up to that house and I'm like, that house over here. And I'm like, what the heck? And they're like, oh, well, you know, 
I, your son, I got no, no, his son decided to do what he wanted to do. I'm like, maybe you just weren't watching him properly. And I offered to help. And I thought there were enough people here. That's why you told me to go away. Now, if you took a video of my son running down the driveway, would I be a bad parent? I don't know. That's the whole point. You take things, you can take everything out of context. And so something looks bad. I mean, I have one of my, one of my favorite stories is uh, I was home once and I, I don't know, I, I don't know, if, somehow my friend called and I don't know what happened. I tried to answer the phone. I didn't quite answer the phone and, <laughs> and I was shrieking at my kids. <laughs> I don't know what I was shrieking at them. I was there. They annoyed the heck out of me. So I was shrieking at the kids. <laughs> no, there were three of them. And then I guess I didn't know my friend was still on the phone listening to me shrieking at the kids. And ever since then, she goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. And we were shrieking at the kids. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, God, you know, thank God that's not on video. That was in the old days when we didn't have video. So it was great. Um, but in that moment, I looked like a really crappy mother. I looked mean and horrible. But, you know, I raised three great kids. I homeschooled them. I think I'm a good mother. But. Did I have some bad days? And were my kids a little shit sometimes? Yes, they were. <laughs> so just because we see Summer acting a certain way one day or her mother acting a certain way one day doesn't mean anything. You know, we can't take things out of context. We have to look at the entire picture. And I just think it's unfair that we do that. However, there are things that don't make sense. And that's what I point out is something. What? Oh, God. Okay, maybe someone in the foresty woods either lured her out or watching her, knew the family, they lived apart, no neighbor, oh my God, no. Oh, you know, this is, this is a, it's so unrealistic. You could, okay, I'm going to say, should the police look at that possibility? Yeah, it's about 5%. Um, you would have, where do you park your vehicle? Where, where, where are you hiding in the woods for how long? Because the child was gone most of the day. You're waiting for the moment she comes home. And then what? Five people are around and you're going to take the risk of what? How do you lure her out? What are you luring her out with? I mean, really, are you, are you like, like sneaking up to the door and going, I got, I got ice cream for you? I mean, and you know, there's, there's other kids in the house and the mother's right there and the grandmother's right there. This is, this is what I call, this is the kind of fantastical theories that, yes, you know, and, uh, it could happen, but you cannot base an investigation on something so unlikely, something incredibly unlikely like that, because you have to invent, you know, when you do profiling, uh, investigative work, you go with what human people, pe human people do, what people normally do, not what they don't do. So, you know, studying case after case after case, I'm going to tell you, that is not the way a predator works. He doesn't need to do that. That's a, that's a whole lot of work. And a whole lot of danger for absolutely no reason in the broad daylight. No, I, I say that's absolutely un unrealistic. Um, well, well, okay. How long was that two minutes really? Two minutes. This is what I'm thinking. I think the mother was jealous of dad's love for Summer and got rid of her and sold her for drugs. Oh, God, no. Again, that's excessive. I mean, <laughs> that's excessive. It's, it's not, pe people don't sell their kids for drugs. I mean, I, that, this, this is very, very, it doesn't happen hardly ever. I mean, it's just something so rare. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say they don't sell their kids for drugs or sell their kids into prostitution. This is true. But this is usually done by somebody, for example, a single mom who's a, a drug user, a severe drug user, and, and she's in some really, she's alone with a child, and somebody comes along and says, hey, you know, and she's like, oh, whatever. She's already involved with some dude and the dude just takes her away. This is not a woman who's got three other children. The grandmother's there, the father's there. No, I mean, that's just, just un, uh, unlikely. Um, no, <laughs> the boys are playing video games. Maybe she came back up upstairs, out the door and got snatched. Where? She got snatched in the front of her house, between the house and the trailer that the, grandma, the grandmother's living in. We're talking a few feet, a very few feet. I mean, what is it? I don't know, 20, if you're gonna say 20 feet. Very short area. Nobody drove up on the driveway. There's no sound of dogs barking. She walks out the door where the mother is coming toward the house and somebody snatches her. No, this is this is where it gets un unreasonable. Um, Ladybug. Well, that's an interesting point. I think that maybe police asked why her hands were dirty and she said she planted flowers. 
That is an interesting point. And I thought about that. Sometimes people make excuses for things they were trying to cover for something. Like she's got no shoes on. And the question might be, well, she's not trying to explain why the child has no shoes on when generally speaking, the child would have shoes on. Um, why would she, why doesn't she have shoes on? Uh, why, why would her hands be, you know, they're going to wash their hands and uh, because we're, doing, we're planting flowers. So it's, it's, I'm, I, my hands are dirty because I planted flowers, but I don't know why, what? That's an interesting question. Why did Summer wash her hands and nobody else wash their hands? Did she say all of them washed their hands or Summer, they washed Summer's hands? Not sure. But those are interesting points that, again, uh, the, the police are going to be looking at um, to things that are inconsistent, things that don't, don't really make sense. Um, this is true, but also not true. You'll be shocked how easy it is to trick, alert children, teens, and adults. Yes, but not from there. And so this is a, this is the point. Even a, a serial killer, ser child predators and stuff, pick people that, this is what happened with the Madeline McCann case. Madeline McCann is a, was a almost four-year-old child who goes missing out of a, a Port Portuguese uh, 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 um, rental. Um, they rented a flat in, in, in a Portuguese uh, this club where they, you know, all the, all the families go and play. And their parents are British doctors. Now, a big deal was made of, oh, they, you know, she was kidnapped because, oh, she, you know, she, she's a kidnap victim. I think, who the hell would do this? Who in their right mind would say, look, I want to get this little kid. I'm going to pick a family of vacationers from Britain that, that is going to throw a, make a huge police investigation, an international incident. No, that's just nonsense. Why would you do that? You know how many kids you can grab that are just wandering around? I mean, and people, you know, a lot of people it's like, oh, you know, this child, who was this? lovely child of, of, of English doctors. And, and she was like a little well-educated blonde child. Look, the kid's three. All you do is grab a blonde child from a drug addict, you know, 30 miles away with a woman's completely, you know, bombed out of her mind and she's unconscious. And the little three-year-old is walking around in circles and you go, yeah, I can take her. And then, then the druggy mom tells the police, Oh my, 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 my daughter disappeared. And then they're like, yeah, well, who was it? Was it your pimp? Was it your drug dealer? And it's easy to get away with. You don't go and start an international incident. It's nonsense. So in this particular instance, I'm not saying somebody couldn't kidnap Summer or, or lure her. I'm just saying the location makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense at all. Uh, that If she was going to school and was wandering down the street by herself, or if she did indeed wander all the way down the street by herself and just get picked up along the way, that's possible. Now, if she wandered out of the house and when walked up that long street, just for whatever reason, she just decided to go on a long hike, long hike which actually five-year-olds sometimes do, and was far, far away from the house and got grabbed, that is possible. It is possible that the mother therefore is just trying to account for her lack of paying attention to her child because it would be, wouldn't be two minutes. It would be far longer than two minutes. And she, she just might be covering up for herself. Um, but so, I mean, that's possible. So we can't take the possibility of abduction off the table. If summer wandered way down the street, she would have to be wandering down the street for a, for her to come in contact with a vehicle. And I'm not sure exactly how far she'd have to actually walk before she would come in contact with a vehicle. In other words, where the driveway would intersect with another road and somebody just see this little five-year-old wandering about and say, oh, you know, and then you have to have a predator there at the exact per perfect time. Could that happen? Yes, it could. And it could be the mother's just covering up for the fact she wasn't paying attention. It, it happens. Um, so the police are going to look at that and they should, they should, they should do that. Um, let's, let's see what else do we have here for, um, that is a good question. Uh, Ladybug says, "Wonder the truth uh, if the boys saw Summer in the house." That's what the police are have to have to determine. Oh, thank you, Desiree. You're spot on, Pat. I don't know that I am, but I'm just trying to point out what what uh, what the evidence and behaviors show at this point. By the way, there's behavioral evidence and there's physical evidence, and behavioral evidence can be just as good as physical evidence. Um, well, I'll say this: it, it it's good in in the investigative stage. Behavioral evidence is excellent investigative stage, but you know, using that in court of law is something else. When you get to the court of law, you need a lot more than than that. Um, oh, 
Betsy says, I'm talking some sense. Well, may we already pointed that out. <laughs> Somebody already pointed that out. But thank you. I, I, I try to point out some sense. Telling a poor, poorly scripted story. Well, you know, that's the problem with stories um, that when they don't make sense, they don't make sense. But, you know, what is very true about people who try to stage a crime or try to cover up a crime, they try, they try to come up with a story that they think will be convincing. Uh, and they don't know how to do it because I've never done it before. You know, so how do you, you know, it's interesting. Serial kills are much better at this because if they've already killed three or four times, they're really good with coming up with phony stories. But, but you know, a person who's doing something that's, oh, just an accident happened, I'm covering it up or whatever. A lot of times they just don't know how to make it look right. Um, so, or, or let's say a husband kills his wife and he's trying to cover up that scene. And then he does a really bad job of that. He tries to explain what happened to his wife. And, it, and, and you're like, really? That doesn't, that doesn't sound right because that's not the way things work. That is not the way things work. Um, yeah, that's that's my point, Kelly. Uh, the boys wouldn't say she went downstairs to play with the toys. It would be more like she went. Down, she's downstairs. Yeah, I thought that was a weird statement because boys really don't care what she's doing downstairs. I, don't, I doubt the five-year-old's going, I'm going downstairs to play with my toys. I don't know that she'd bother to say that. She'd just wander on downstairs, and then the boys would be ignoring her, and then say, the mother would say, where is she? Downstairs. So I thought that was a little interesting uh, too. So yeah, that's exactly right, Martin. Uh, she was nowhere in sight. She was, and the eyeballs, just gone. Peter Hyatt would have a look at that. He would. And the, oh, but, oh, I didn't even, I missed my own thing. What, what word is in that statement? Come on, somebody. What word is in that statement that tells me a lie is coming up after that? Can somebody tell me what that word is? I've explained it. Can somebody come up with it? <laughs> What's the word? that I don't like, that shows up oftentimes, and then the, the statement following that word is not truthful. There you go, Trixie. Yep, Martin's got it. Martin's got it. Oh, sorry. Martin's got it. Just. Trixie Cat's got it. Just. Yes. She was just gone. That's the word I was talking. I didn't even, I, did, I missed it myself, and then, you know, because I was so interested in just the way she rolled her eyes and said that she was gone when she's just not in the house, because just because she's not in the house does not mean she's gone. It just means she's outside. Wouldn't you think your kid's outside? I mean, the, <laughs> you know, if my granddaughter wasn't in the house, I'd assume she's outside. She's not gone until I look everywhere and I can't find her. Then I'd say, oh, my God, she's gone, but not because she's not in that one room. That makes no sense. But, yes, the word, she was just gone. God, that, I, I missed my own word. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> that that's, you know, I'm all, you know, when I do this, I'm not preparing just to, in my own defense. Um, I'm not preparing an analysis for the, for law enforcement by preparing an analysis for law enforcement. I spend a great deal more time analyzing each detail. Sometimes people are on here going, Pat, you got the time wrong. You've got this wrong. I'm like, yeah, cause you know, I'm really not going to spend 20 hours analyzing every detail for my YouTube show. I'm just trying to, you know, educate and help people understand things. But yes, if I were doing it for the police, many, many, many more hours would be put in to making sure I, I looked at every every bit of the detail. Um, so I lost two on um, I'm trying to see. Yeah, oh, yeah, same with Kate McCann. Someone took her. Mm -hmm. um, she could, and, and in reality, unless the house were totally locked down, like I think it was uh, with, with the McCann case, the child in searching for her parents could have left the house and wandered, wandered off someplace. And so, but you know, that that's a whole nother story. So because the window was open, you know, and the wind was blowing in. That's another whole, another whole show there. Uh, let's see. Oh, honestly, that's a, that, you know, you point out something to honestly is a, yeah, that's another kind of one of those words that makes people wonder why people say that. Now they're obviously trying to over, express that they're telling the truth you know on my mother's grave uh honestly uh, i want you to believe me that and, and you know some people do say some of these things just in saying those things but um oh i've got all these just out here just 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 just, just. <laughs> that's great um yeah so annie and get your bun i love that name uh I, that looks good um and it, something about the behavior during the interview with Don and one of his sons gets strange vibes. And I did too. I'm, I did not put that video up, but yes, it was a very long interview and that son looked so uncomfortable. And he was like, he was not just patting him and holding him. He was almost 
holding him there. And it, it's again, I, I wasn't comfortable with that myself. I it looked like that he's you know, it looked more like he was saying, you know, be quiet, go with the program. Then he's saying, you know, my poor son has to stand here and 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 listen to me say all these horrible things. Which again, I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I want my son there while I was saying even talking to the media personally. I mean, I just say, let my, let, I'll talk to you. Let my son go inside and I'll chat with you. I thought it was, it was, it was, it was a little weird. Um, again, one of those things you just question, uh, what, what, what's, we you know what really happens there. Um, yeah, this is, this is true. And I think stranger winter says stranger abductions are rare. The parents should be the prime suspects until they're cleared. And it's important to clear them. And this is something that, it's so important to clear them because what happens is, as you can see, only a month has gone by and there's a million fa fantastical theories already. You want, as a parent, first to be cleared so that they can go look for the right guy, the right guy. If you, if you didn't do it, if you didn't do something to your child and your child has been abducted, for God's sakes, clear me quick because my kid, every minute you waste your time on me, my child might be in a basement being tortured. So. I want to get, get me out of the picture. Um, so that's a very important thing that you want to get cleared as quick as you can. Uh, and the second reason is that when you do not properly clear people, then by the time you figure out, you, you go back and start looking at them, they can't even defend themselves because now their alibis are crap because maybe they did have an alibi, but you never investigated their alibi. And now five years later or a year later or whatever, you can't even prove your alibi because a guy died. You know, so now you now you now you're screwed because you were never cleared. You, sh you know, so you want to clear people. And not only the parents, you want to clear anybody else that might be suspicious, because you don't again want that to come back on. You know, if you're one of the you know witnesses or a guy lived down the road, you don't want them to come after you for the next twenty years. You want to be cleared if you can be cleared. So that's really really important that uh, the the parents do that, get themselves uh, be as honest, open, clear themselves if they can. Now. The, the father does claim they all took a polygraph. He took a polygraph. Candace took a polygraph and Grandis took a polygraph and um, they all cleared them. He said that. I don't know that that's true. Um, I don't know because we haven't heard from the police and, and the police aren't necessarily truthful about that. So I don't actually know. Um, well, Anna says, I feel Summer followed someone. Who? Who was there? There's nobody there. The family was there. Something, an animal, an idea. There's, there's no evidence of any of this. See, this is the problem. We, we can't just say we think something because there's no reason to think it. What we have to look at is evidence. You know, it's just making up stuff doesn't, doesn't do us any good. Um, drug users are known for having cameras on the property and house too. Some, but some just, you know, don't. I mean, you know, not everybody does that. I mean, again, so this this is this is bringing in information that is is not is not overly uh, useful. Annie, get your bun. I don't believe she walked summer right to the door. It makes no sense. So she didn't see the siblings were there watching TV. Interesting. Father says they were on the internet. That's the one thing that was different. I feel like it's possible for everyone is covering for small folks. Uh, no, no, but you know, I find it a little weird that she found a necessity to walk her. 20 feet and make a big deal of it. So yeah, uh, it's just, oh, well, this person says, Anna Morris says, I too feel the parents are sincere. Well, maybe they are, but I, I can't get past what the, 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 um, the mother's statement is questionable to me, just as questionable. But again, uh, as I've always pointed out, this is a, pol oh, there is, see, this is crap I don't go with. She's been sex trafficked. You have no clue of that, none. Don't make up stories that you do not know and you have zero evidence. Garbage. And that that's that's just that's just this is the kind of stuff that gets out of hand and it makes me angry because there is no proof she was sex trafficked. That's just ridiculous. Absolutely no proof whatsoever. And so saying so doesn't do any do any good. Um Anna, this is questionable. How far from the house did the search dogs track the child? I'm hearing different stories, and I don't know what stories are true. And there, there, there again comes the problem that I don't know that the police have given us detailed statements of what the dogs did and what the dogs do, cadaver dogs or just scent dogs. I don't know. Therefore, I've heard stories and I'm not going to tell them because I just don't know. Um, and it's, um, 
it's you know yeah I, I just don't i just won't go there so um well that's true and not true and it says just as a word that denotes time the dog was just annoying me now she's now under the bed she's just not very time conscious probably lots of things seem like they just happened that's a good uh, you know that there is a truth in that um i will not deny it we do use the word just in our regular lives uh, but interesting enough as i point out and this is where the behavior guys come into sometimes, you know, they're, they're trying to explain why they, they say things. I have to tell you that can't, there's so many statement analysis I've done. I don't do the type Peter Hyatt does. He does all the little detailed words. I don't do that. I look for things that are like, <laughs> really? That, that's an interesting statement to make. Um, uh, and the word just for people who I know are guilty, and committed the crime and are denying they committed the crime, you'd be surprised how often that word is there. Just something to, it's just an education thing. Um, yes, we do word, do use word just. I, I just got home in time to do this show. You know, that's true. You do use it in that way, but there's times when they use it where you wonder why they used it. And it, it has a different meaning in different circumstances. So again, it's a tool. Please let it be a tool and uh, not, uh, you know, an absolute. And so that's where I go. with. But I say, again, it's everything together. It's not just the word just. It's the fact that she's shocked her daughter isn't downstairs and knows she's gone when, all, when her daughter simply could have left the house. It's the two minutes that makes no sense. It's the over, it's I had, I walked her all the way over there and I made sure she was, all these things make no sense. Doesn't mean she's guilty, but they're concerning because it is not quite what you would expect. And, and, and there's it, it's inconsistent with what her behavior should be or what she's done. I mean, there's problems with it. That's the thing. It's, it's problematic. And therefore, the police go, if they're if they're thinking the same way, I, I don't know if they're thinking the same way I am. If I were working with the police, I'd point all these things out and I'd say, you need to do some more work with her. You need to find out more about her day and what happened two hours prior to the two minutes. And I'd also say you need to check with that grandmother because I don't understand why Grandis, Candace, Grandis is so quiet about this crime when her other, when her own daughter was 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 abducted and liked and murdered. Why she would not be more vocal? It just seems strange to me. She's so incredibly quiet about this, and she was a, maybe a witness to what happened. I would be very concerned. I would say you need to really work on finding out from her and you need to find out more from the husband, whether he's just repeating what the, what his wife and uh, uh, mother-in-law have said, and he has some suspicion that they're not telling the truth. And I want to know more from the three boys. Did they actually, what happened to the, what happened with those three boys though? I mean, I know they were stayed home alone while Candace and, and, and Grandice and Summer went off on their, their errands and their, and their things that they were doing that day. They were alone for most a good portion of the day, which some people would question too, but one of the boys was older. So I'm just going to say they were not overly protective of, of the kids. Uh, and they stayed home and did whatever they did. I would like to know when did their, when was the last time they saw Summer? When was the last time, when did the, 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 the Candace and Grannis actually drive in the driveway? Did they see Summer get out of the vehicle in one piece, healthy and alive? What happened in the next two hours before she was reported missing? What, where was Summer then? Was she running around the house? Was she inside? Where was the child? Where, you know, what, where, was, where was their mother? Where was the grandma? Where is all this? Did the car ever leave again? These are the questions I would ask over and over again. Um, so, you know, these are, they, but those are the questions that, that the, the police will take a look at. And, and uh, <laughs> that, but that's not true. It is a big deal. I was, where was that comment here? Um, no, that's not just, just equals not a big deal. I'm not sure what that means, whether the word just isn't a big deal or what happened wasn't a big deal, but it is, it is just, I say one of those interesting things that pops up in, in deception. It, it does. Um, oh, that's very nice. Lieutenant Brooke. Thank you, Pat. I've watched a few of those so-called body language experts and said, and they're clowns. <laughs> Peter Hyatt is excellent. So are you. <laughs> well, I'm not going to call them clowns. I just think they have a different approach. And there are some things we can learn from there. And, you know, 
What? Uh, no. Okay. So this is another this is another theory that makes no sense. Gunhild, female serial killer. And then there's she's, the person she's saying, she or he is saying Candace her. So you're actually saying the grandmother killed her daughter, and then her grandmother killed her granddaughter. No, that didn't happen. The daughter, the daughter that went missing, the number one suspect is the husband. It all matches that. It has nothing to do with the grandmother. Um, I don't believe for a minute that she also killed her. Uh, killed, no, no. Just, just, that's, there's just no, nothing, nothing at all that supports that. So it's just, oh God. so anyway, uh, oh, well, we don't know this, by the way. Uh, Shanna says not mention, no mention of unloading the groceries, milk, but share so many other unnecessary details like the piece of candy. I don't know what she told the police. This is, this is important to understand what, you know, I'm going to give the family a little break here on that. The media sucks. A media will come to your damn door, stick a microphone in your face and make you talk and say things that you're uncomfortable. Um, they, they trip you up and they, and they, and they're not investigators that are invest, they're saying, doing these things to get information. They're the media. And, and so sometimes it's a very uncomfortable situation. You don't know what the media wanted them to talk about the media. When did, when did she go missing? Then they didn't maybe never asked her about milk or what happened to the other two hours of the day. That's the detective's job. The media may not, is not doing that. They're asking, they're, depending on how long their segment is going to be, uh, is how, how many questions they're going to ask. Um, I know, God knows, that's uh, one of the reasons I'm actually having pretty good time doing YouTube because I've been here, how long have I been on this thing now? Ah, um, I've been here quite a while now. Let's see what, oh my God, almost two hours. Um, when I was on television all those years, I rarely got more than two minutes. You know, if I was a lucky day, I was the only guest. And I actually got to say, like, answer three questions. And I used to try to get stuff in. And, and people would say, you talk too fast. And I think I learned that because I, I had such a small sound bite. I was trying to get in information that I knew if I didn't get the information out, they would cut me off. And, and what I said would be meaningless or even incorrect. Um, because I just started talking and then you, oh, and then we'll go on to the next question because we only have, you know, your Pat Brown has only got a two minute segment. Um, it's very frustrating. So, so I don't know what the media asked them, wanted them to talk about, edited out. You never know any of this stuff. They're, the police, I'm sure, went through the entire day with them. That is stuff we do not know. And we don't have to know it. I mean, it's, it's not our business, quite frankly. Um, it's the police's business. They're in doing this case. They're solving this case. We're not going to solve this case. I'm not here. As I pointed out before, my channel is not about solving cases. I, I, I think that's ridiculous. I, that's, and it makes me angry when I see people say, do 20 videos in a row analyzing every detail as if we're solving the case. We're not. All I'm trying to do here is help you understand the case. That's it, to understand police investigation and profiling and how things actually work. I'm not going to solve this case. I have an opinion, but the police are going to solve this case. And, and, and the best thing we can do, uh, in my opinion, is that police get the best training possible for, for analysis of cases, because sometimes police don't get enough training and, you know, therefore they don't, they don't see things that might be useful if they saw. Maybe an expert who knows some more about doing this, like, you know, somebody who can actually analyze all this stuff and work with the police would be advantageous, but a lot of police departments don't like people from the outside being there. And I understand the politics involved in that. Uh, so police need great training. They, or they need inside analysts who can work with them, keep their mouth shut so that, you know, they can work the cases without ending up in a political fiasco um, and having the media all over them. So, you know, um, you can't really trust what we hear publicly as much as you can can hear what the police will actually know for themselves. So, um, and, and this is this is true at the point. Ladybug says everyone is a suspect at this point. Now, that's not, well, not entirely true. Um, the police will know who is not a suspect, okay? There are people who have alibis, 100% alibis. They're not suspects. They were nowhere near the crime scene. Uh, there's no, there's no way they're gonna, they, they couldn't have done anything to her or abducted her. So not everybody is a crime scene. So, um, so that's, you know, we don't know again what they know. So they're gonna, they're going to, they're going to follow the investigation because they have a ton of information that 
they have access to that we do not. Um, and uh, that's very true. Um, Oh, okay. What does the West say here? Christine, uh, Christine, being an ongoing investigation, we civilians don't have anything, but what the media wants us to know. That's very true, Christine. That's why I like Pat telling us her point of view. Yeah, this is, this is a huge problem. Now, in some cases, uh, people say, can you take a look at this case? Now, here's the thing. The Madeleine McCann case, there were the police actually had the entire police files. So there was a lot to look at and you could do a lot of analysis. Even then, I didn't make my commentary until uh, uh, Kate McCann put out her book because then I got like an interview, that, her own words for the entire book. And she has to approve of every word that goes in that book. And so it was like a massive interview with Kate McCann. That's when I finally wrote my book on the case. Uh, there are other cases where people say, can you look into this case? And I'm like, you know, I can't access the police reports. So that's saying, oh, well, the, you know, I, I just, I, you know, all I'm getting is a pile of media reports. I'm getting... a an author's viewpoint. Uh, they wrote a whole book on it. I don't know if there's anything in that book that has has validity, unless I can see the original police reports. And so therefore I have the original interviews. I have all the details. And even that is not necessarily always correct, but you know, at least you're getting as close to correct as you can, as far as the information and evidence goes. But because you watch Netflix, doesn't mean you're getting any information because the media is is come up and saying something doesn't mean that's information um, or half of the YouTube channels they come up and say, oh, this is true and this is true. You don't know that that's true. So unless you know what the police know, you do not know the truth. And it's very hard to then analyze things uh, from the outside. And that's why we're not, generally speaking, going to be solving cases from the outside. We can understand things from the outside, but we can't necessarily. <laughs> solve them from the outside. Um, but we can support the police and hope that they do the best job possible. Um, and I'm going to say this, you know, most police, you know, a homicide department, um, if there's, you know, if they have a homicide department or if there's sometimes a very small, uh, you know, sheriff's department, they might not have an actual department. Um, but I'm going to say that the detectives that take over these cases, they want to solve them. I mean, it's not like they don't want to solve this. When people are so mean about detectives, uh, you know, oh, they're not doing their job, blah, blah, blah. They want to solve them. This is their job. They want to do it right. They want to catch the bad guy. They absolutely want to do this. The problem is, depends on the case. Some cases are very, they're, they're obvious. You know who did it. And then you can just, got, you know, do, it, do everything properly so you can, get, you know, present the evidence to the court and, and you don't get screwed over because you did some, you know, something that wasn't properly done. You didn't read the Miranda rights or whatever. Somebody says you didn't do right. You didn't have a search warrant. So the police first thing they learn when they, you know, go to, you know, a police academy or whatever is they, they got these things they have to do properly or they get screwed in court and the court will, you know, the defense attorney is going to try to screw them every way they can. So the police try to do everything right. And they do a lot of work on trying to do things right as far as, you know, make sure the case is protected. Um, does it always work out that well? No. Sometimes, you know, depending on the size, size of department, um, who, you know, what training they got, sometimes things go wrong. I, I've seen, you know, crime scenes that are complete, complete disaster where they weren't protected. People stomped all over them. You know, the mayor was there. I mean, things go wrong. And then, so if you have a case where it's either obvious and you just have to do the right things to get it to court, or you have a case where you're pretty sure you got an idea of who did it, like it's a gang killing or, or whatever. And you can follow like cameras and things like that. And, you know, GPSs and all that stuff. And you can put all the pieces together and be able to present it. These are the cases that the police do very well on and can solve. What happens with cases where the evidence is just lacking is that they have to work very hard to try to a figure out what the truth is and then get actually get evidence. And if that can be very, very tricky. And as I always point out, the first 48 is still the most important, even with profiling, because if you don't analyze the case as best you can in the beginning, you give time for people to fix their stories, to get rid of evidence, to, to you know, all the things they do, and then it's too late. Um, so you really want to have the detectives be good analysts. I say detectives should be the profilers themselves. They are the profilers. They're the real profilers in the world. Um, it'd be nice if we had criminal profilers like me um, who could work with the department as a full-time person. And when they had a case like this, while they're running around doing stuff, I could be just analyzing and analyzing and then say, hey, hey, it's only been 24 hours, but let me tell you what I see. And then they can move on. But most police departments don't have 
uh, profilers on the staff. So it is the detectives themselves who do the analysis of the case and they are the ones that do the profiling. And people always say, well, why don't you bring the FBI in? FBI is rarely brought in on any of these cases. The departments don't want them there. And it's, it's again, by the time they, the, you know, media and the public force them to bring in somebody, it's usually, you know, you months, months later, years later, and isn't all that useful. So we need the best training for detectives, the both support for our police departments, right, right, right at the, you know, ground zero, essentially. So, oh, <laughs> Lady Bake says, the police said everyone is a suspect, not me. <laughs> well, they always say that, <laughs> but good point. Yeah, uh, and, you know, uh, and by the way, this is not necessarily true. I want to, I want to clear up this misconception because it drives me crazy. The police are holding information close to the vest on this case. You know, people say that on every damn case. You know what it really means? One of two things. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's true. They know stuff that we do not know. Other times they don't know jack shit. <laughs> they don't have a clue. So it goes, it's both ways. And we don't know from the outside. So, so we know the fact that we always say that is, is just not, not necessarily so. Uh, they may have no idea what the heck happened. They can't find anything. They don't, can't find her body. They can't find anybody who, that they can see abducted her. Maybe they've interviewed the family and they can't come up with enough deception to say it's the family. I don't know what they've got. Or, or you might be right. They might know exactly who did it. And they're not going to tell us till they have the, have all the evidence because it's none of our damn business. So they're going to get all the evidence so they can take this case to court because they're not solving the case for the public. They're solving the case to bring justice to summer and put a killer, if it's a killer or somebody who's criminally involved, put them where they belong. That's what their job is. It's not to satisfy us until, you know, I mean, we, we do hire them. They are, they are our quote servants, you know, because our tax dollars pay for them. So yes, they're supposed to be there to protect the community. That's important. They, you know, if there's a killer out there who is dangerous to the community, yes, they need to try to catch that killer before he harms the rest of the community. So the, in that sense, we have the right to the best uh, police work that we can get. That is true. But we're not always entitled to know everything, uh, especially if, if they, uh, <laughs> if, if they know what they're doing and they don't have to give us information. So yeah, this is true, Trixie. Uh, rumors and speculation have taken over this case. People repeat those things as fact. And that, that is the problem, you know, we, uh, we that, and that gets out of hand and it's, it's really a shame. So, but I do hope that eventually one figures out what is that called? Is, Anna asks, is there a direct connection to the FBI and child disappearance cases? Something called Orion. You know, actually, I don't even know. I'm going to look that up. I, I, um, yeah, they, 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 their new names change all the time. There's this, you know, new names that come in. Um, I thought it was odd after 30 days it didn't have a suspect. Um, okay, so as far as FBI goes, sometimes the police will contact them and say, take a look at and see if there's any similar issues. Um, you know, kids disappearing or whatever um, in a certain area. Um, as far as uh, Ladybug saying, I thought it was odd after 30 days they didn't have a suspect. I don't know why that would be odd. So if, 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 if she was abducted and they don't know who did it, they wouldn't have a suspect. And if the family did it, but they can't prove it, they, they're not going to tell you they have a suspect. They're not going to sim simply say, oh, we think Ma has something to do with it. They're not going to tell us that if that's true, because they're not going to do anything until they can prove it. And other than that, they must, if it's not, the parents' uh, involvement of any sort, or the grandmothers, or one of the other kids. If the family's not involved, they just don't have anybody. They just haven't found anybody. You know, it's like. And as far as a case going cold, uh, most cases are cold after 48 hours. There's a reason they say that, um, uh, and they'll deny it. They'll deny it. Four years later, they'll deny it. the case is not cold. Well, if it's four years, it's going to be definitely cold. Um, so the case is cold as soon as you have either no idea who did it <laughs> and you have no forthcoming evidence that's really doing a lot for you or that you can't prove who did it, did it. So then it goes cold and you're waiting then on a miracle. The miracle is usually DNA or a confession. That's it. Um, and it is, it is cold then. Uh, and they don't like to admit it's cold because people get really pissed off when you, <laughs> you know, when police go, 
you know, can you imagine you're, you're, you've you're lost, let's say your child's gone missing and you go to the place, what are you doing to find my child? It's been a year and they go, oh, we're not doing a damn thing, you know. We, we quite frankly have given up. We're just, hey, your case is shelved right now. We're just, we're just hoping one day somebody comes through and just says, I did it. How do you think that's going to go over? <laughs> that's not going to go over well. So, you know, that'll be in the media the next day. So, of course, the, the police say, we're working on it. Famous words, we are working on it. You can ask any family of a missing or murdered person, the case has not been solved. They will tell you those are the four words they use. We're, we are, we're, that's five. We are working on it. We're working on it. That's what they say all the time. So, you know, and because I can't really say anything else, it's unfortunate, but they really can't. Um, so very difficult. So anyway, I think that's going to be it for today. I've, I've gone into the two o'clock hour here. Whew. Okay. <laughs> but you've all been great. You've all been great today. Well, I've enjoyed you as you know, people wonder why I'm doing live and not, not, not taped because you know, when you do live stuff, things can go wrong. Like my bad transmission from yesterday, last time, last week, which I hope isn't true today. Um, or people can ask you questions you can't answer. <laughs> you look like an idiot <laughs> or your cat bothers you or whatever. But I do enjoy being here with a, 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 a real people, real people. You know, I've done te television for so many years and you're just sitting there and you stare at a camera it's a blank camera and you hear the host ask you questions and you, you know, answer the questions and they say, thank you very much, Pat. And you go, Oh, thank you. Whoever it was. And then you just pull the thing out of your ear, and pull off the mic and you walk out, you get in the car and you go home. And then maybe you see something on Facebook or Twitter that says, Oh, I like what you said, but you don't get to interact with people. And, uh, and you don't get more than two minutes usually. So this is kind of an, uh, just a real fun thing for me to do now because I actually know I can, get information out to people. I can actually talk about things. Um, kind of like when I, you know, I, I was, I was, I was a professor for one year, uh, for the college that I, I developed the first criminal profiling certificate program for until they fired me for, oh, they didn't fire me. They let me go because I didn't grade inflate and wouldn't allow plagiarism. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but during that period of time, I did enjoy communicating with the students because they wanted to learn and they, and they were trying to understand crime scenes and do their analysis. And, and I was getting rid of the myths they had and also helping them understand, you know, how, how to think of things through. And it was really, I really did enjoy that. And I, I think I would have been a happy professor under other circumstances, but that's life. And so now I have this opportunity again to, to reach out and to educate and to share. And, and some of you have some really great thoughts and, things that I don't even think about. Uh, and so I, I like that. I, although I will stomp down on nonsense and bad, really bad speculation. <laughs> and if you're one of those people that hates me for that, well, you know, okay. <laughs> I'm expecting that it's YouTube, you know, it's an open, it's an open field and, uh, you know, uh, everybody can come here and, uh, comment. So, uh, I won't necessarily listen to your comments if it's, if it's outrageous and I might comment if it is, but, uh, uh hopefully it's still, a good learning experience that everybody can get something out of. So, uh, so next week is going to be, maybe I am here next week. Oh, I am going to be here next week. Maybe the week after that, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to go take a little trip with my granddaughter and my daughter and, uh, and we will come, ha we will come home and then we'll plant some flowers. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> so, anyway, um, uh, so I will see you all next week. I will, I will be here, and I hope you'll be here too. So, I've had a really good time with you today. So, see you next week. Bye. <laughs> and now I can't find. Look, I have this thing it's called an ending. Bye. I'm gonna try again. Ending. Ha <laughs> ha.